the most absurd conversation that I had was like literally from TikTok. People reached out and they wanted me to join their two hour long board meeting, public pharma company. Like what they hired me to do is to sit there and just like be a sounding board for as they're thinking through what does an AI strategy mean? If everybody can post on Twitter and everybody has an AI that just like takes their raw thoughts and puts them into like high performing tweets and everybody is using these agents. Okay, is anybody actually on Twitter anymore? If you're paying attention, you can feel at least like you're making progress. The number one thing I recommend to people is start using ChatGPT with an automation tool like Zapier or Make. We are using AI for like so many things that are like so serious. And honestly, sometimes it's just really fun to use AI to make much better memes. And like, I've never been a person who's good at making memes before, and now I feel like I can make ones that make me laugh at least. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas, and together we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, we continue our AI in Media series with special guest Rachel Woods. Rachel was previously a data scientist at Meta, where she worked on AI systems that support the small business advertising platform. And she was also the founder of Vinebase, an e-commerce and marketing platform focused on small vineyards, which she sold to Corksy in 2022. Today, Rachel is the founder of the AI Exchange and best known for her Twitter and especially her TikTok profile, where she creates roughly one video per day to help people keep up with and understand all the latest AI news. She also dispenses practical advice for both individuals and companies. The AI Exchange publishes a regular newsletter, which you can subscribe to at news.theaiexchange.com, and she provides additional resources, community, and even optional consulting services for subscribers. Rachel and I talked about the kind of audience she is reaching, just how quickly people are waking up to the opportunity of AI, how many companies that didn't have AI in their 2023 plans are now scrambling to adapt, how she tries to consult with and guide those companies forward, and lots, lots more. I hope you enjoy this delightful conversation with Rachel Woods. Rachel Woods, welcome to the Cognitive Revolution. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. I think you have staked out a really interesting position for yourself as a sort of very smart and plugged in AI influencer, popularizer, educator. Um, so I'd love to start off by just asking you a little bit about like how you conceive of the role that you're playing and um, you know who your audience is and how you decided to do this in such a, at, at such an opportune time. Yeah, so um, a little bit of luck and foresight, I think, is kind of the the moral of my story in this space. So I actually started my TikTok account November 1st, which if you think back to the timing of that, uh, before the whole world cared about ChatGPT, uh, it's almost comical that that was like, you know, the month before everything imploded or exploded, however you uh, want to think about it. But yeah, I mean, so my story is I was a data scientist before, um, and then I uh, founded a venture back startup in the e-commerce space where we were actually using GPT-3 a bunch in that product. Um, and after kind of that experience and seeing the impact that large language models were having on what we were building, I was like, okay, the world like maybe doesn't care yet, but the world needs to know that AI can do this crazy thing where it writes for you. Um, and that ended up being like that, plus a little bit of a joke of like, I'm going to go be a TikTok influencer was the impetus to go start a TikTok account, uh, which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been a, a crazy journey since then. So now you're reaching regularly something like 100,000 people a day. And obviously there's, you know, spikes on top of that on TikTok. What is the what is the state of the public, you know, the, the broad public uh, right now who just like comes across your videos? I'm so deep down the rabbit hole myself. And I think probably most of our listeners are that I, you know, sometimes find it's like easy to lose touch with what somebody who's cruising TikTok and like sees one of your videos for the first time, you know, might be predisposed to think. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are surprised when I tell them my stats. So myself included, like, I feel like I originally thought that TikTok was a lot of 
uh, young people doing dances or like funny memes. Um, but 90% of my audience is over the age of 25 and 50% is over the age of 35. And um, they're pre predominantly US based. Um, and then I have the really fun privilege of people reach out to me and like book time with me and, and want to talk. And so I've found out that um, there are mostly business leaders, professionals, founders and engineers, literally like on TikTok nights and weekends, uh, like listening and learning about AI. And then um, funny enough, uh, sharing my TikToks in their company's Slack channels. Um, which I just like sit back for a minute and like think about like being at work and just seeing like a, a stream of TikToks about AI in your Slack um, is pretty pretty funny. But um, yeah, I mean, like I know we're in the AI bubble. I mean, I'm very active on Twitter too. But one thing that's been truly like amazing over the last three, four, five months has just been like the pure like mainstream, especially business explosion and interest in in AI, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that as well with, with what you're doing, but um, it's really there, uh, which has been pretty incredible. Yeah, it seems like we're, I feel like we're in this kind of probably pretty short in between moment where, you know, my joke right now is that I'm, I restarted the calendar on the release of GPT-4. So we're now at GPT-4 plus one month uh, to the day, I believe. And it's, you know, this huge step change where all of a sudden you're seeing like pretty sophisticated reasoning, not quite breakthrough insight, but, you know, like professional grade reasoning on just a super wide range of things. And yet that's not really deployed almost anywhere at this point. And I have no idea, like, to what degree people are, again, like outside of the bubble. Like aware. Yeah, just to have any concept of whether that's happening or not. Because the messages are so confused, right? Like at the same time, you'll see people saying like, it's all hype and, you know, this technology is never going to work. We need a totally different paradigm. And then, you know, at the same time, like other people are reporting that it's, you know, matching human doctors. So, yeah, I just, I don't know. It's like hard to get a read on. But it sounds like you are mostly reaching people that are much more plugged in and kind of shepherding them through education as opposed to, you know, you don't see too many randoms on your page. Yeah. I mean, I would say like the audience that I really speak to is the early adopters across almost every industry. So kind of how I decided to go from TikTok being a fun side thing to it being my full-time thing and building a whole company around it um, was I put a link in my bio January 1st. And within 24 hours, I had six people purchase time with me to talk to me um, about not like the latest prompts or even kind of like how to log into the mid journey discord or uh, discord. But it was like, okay, I see that there's a huge shift in AI. What should my business even be doing in this next wave? Um, and I feel like that is actually like a side of the AI conversation we like don't see on Twitter. We don't see in the, the doomsday conversation is like, there are just so many businesses across like every single industry that are actually sitting down with their board, with their team and thinking, OK, should we be having like rethinking how AI is brought into like our product or or our offering? So then in, uh, from that lens, like some of the things that I think the the AI bubble people are like paying attention to around like these emerging capabilities of reasoning, like other than a lot of ways, the leaders across these other industries are paying attention to those types of trends because they're trying to figure out what does an AI strategy even mean, right? Is an AI strategy that I'm going to have like prompts in my offering to my customers or is an AI strategy that I'm going to have to figure out how to deploy agents, right? Um, and I think that's actually the conversation that's going on, even if you're a lawyer, a dentist, a uh, CEO of a software company that's based out of, you know, uh, maybe not Silicon Valley, like, it really is like the conversation people are having, which is fascinating. I uh, think those conversations sound pretty fascinating. And it sounds like you've had a wide range of them that probably literally does span like, you know, local small business owner all the way up to kind of CEO of a you know significant company. How do you frame things for them when somebody comes to you and is like, okay, you know, here's my deal. 
Um, and maybe the answer is like it's highly contextual, which would be interesting in and of itself. But I'm sure you have some kind of high level frame that you offer, you know, maybe a couple different versions to people who are like, I've seen, you know, I've used JFTPT a little bit. I've seen it on the news, but I'm really kind of at a loss for what this means for my business. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, Nathan, the funniest or like the most absurd conversation that I've had was like literally from TikTok. People reached out and they wanted me to join their two hour long board meeting, public company, public pharma company. And my, like what they hired me to do is to sit there and just like be a sounding board for as they're thinking through, like, what does an AI strategy mean? Like that's the level at which people are actually having conversations. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some commonalities, you know, um, I have done over a hundred of these calls since the beginning of the year. And so I've started to like distill down things into resources, which is like a lot of what we built the business around. But, you know, one question is like, are you going to use AI to improve your internal operations or are you going to use AI to offer a new service or product or experience to your customers? And like, those are, those are pretty distinct conversations a lot of times, um, and I often talk to people about how they think about risk, right? There's a lot more risk in offering an AI solution to your customers today, just on like where the technology and the capabilities and human in the loop and these other like questions, um, limitations we have are versus starting to figure out is it, you know, how you can use it in your internal operations. I just recommend companies start there because they get more of a feedback loop and a sense of the technology. And um, like, you're going to learn stuff that's going to help you figure out how to go and uh, maybe deliver something like different to your customer. But yeah, like I think the thing that would surprise most people is how serious these conversations are and like how like legit um, that it's not just like the AI bubble people uh, saying the words like you in the loop, you know, um, it is it is a much broader audience Uh yeah, fascinating. I agree with your advice for what it's worth to start with something in your own operations. That's certainly how I got comfortable and you know to the point where I felt qualified <laughs> speaking publicly about this technology was really just breaking. And I have, you know, probably sounds like a pretty similar riff. I always talk about identifying discrete tasks that AI can do and then embedding that into like a broader process. Uh, you know, that takes advantage of the ability to delegate to AI. And a lot of times that can be pretty analogous to tasks that are currently done. Sometimes it can be like new tasks or, you know, it can enable scale in new ways. Uh, but just kind of starting with those discrete things of like, is is there a sort of input output where it's like hard now? Um, and if I had, you know, infinite interns or whatever, it could in theory be easy. Uh, if you can identify those places, you get off to a pretty good start. And then you, you feel real value. You definitely learn things, you know, you see some failure modes, um, and hopefully, you know, develop a healthy respect <laughs> for the technology. Um, but yeah, I agree. That's a very, uh, good place for most to start. You know, like when I think about like what to create content on, like, I think there are people in the space who are creating content for the objective of, uh, getting views, growing an account, growing an audience, growing distribution. And, you know, early on, I, I like, I think you have to make a decision of like whether that's going to be your objective in this space because you go down a certain path um, or if your objective is going to be more playing a little bit of the long game, right? And creating like really a relationship um, more as a creator, I guess, than an influencer where you're uh, creating value for people and helping them actually like navigate what's going on, right? I, I think like what um, what I see you talk about online is like very much in these like same same objectives, which is, hey, we sitting here, look at how AI is going to change the way we operate business. And we also see that if people don't really have kind of the right way to think about it or not the full information or they're not really paying attention or they're not inspired to get like small wins, then like this space is going to keep moving and people are not going to be, you know, uh, prepared to ride that wave. Um, and I, I think that that's like, it's just so important. And that's like where I create content from is like, if someone can not feel concerned about the future of their business, because like they watched a few videos, right. Or because they like read my newsletter, then like, that's, that's the win. Like, how do you arm people to, um, to actually feel confident navigating this next wave? Cause 
I think you and I both are sitting here, like, see that there's just going to be a huge change. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. I want to tell you about my new interview show, Upstream. Upstream is where I go deeper with some of the world's most interesting thinkers to map the constellation of ideas that matter. On the first season of Upstream, you'll hear from Mark Andreessen, David Sachs, Balaji, Ezra Klein, Joe Lonsdale, and more. Make sure to subscribe and check out the first episode with A16Z's Mark Andreessen. The link is in the description. OmniKey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. I, do you know anyone who feels, if you could uh, point to anyone who's confident in navigating this, I'd be uh, very interested. I don't feel very confident at all. Do you feel confident? I mean, I feel confident in, um, in like, it's just a step-by-step, -step, like paying attention and trying to make smart decisions along the way, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying like, okay, like people have it totally solved. People know how it's uh, going to play out. But I, I do think there's a level of like, if you're paying attention, you can feel at least like you're making progress, right? And then, you know, like repurposing content, the thing that used to take you like 30% of your time as a content creator, okay, now takes you 2%, right? And like, that's progress. And I, I think like confidence can come out of like those, you know, small wins. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I love the space in many ways. And one of the biggest ones is just how much I'm constantly learning. I try to target like 50% of my, you know, working time just on kind of understanding what's going on and probably do fall a bit short of that, but, you know, have to maintain a pretty good amount or, you know, things get stale so quickly. I've, the number of times that I've kind of gone back and looked at writing from two weeks ago and felt like, well, <laughs> it needs at a minimum, like a significant update is just crazy. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you, you say you don't feel like confident in that. Cause like, I guess I think um, I think looking back and seeing how much the space is changing and then realizing that it's changing, like that's that's actually just like what's going on right now, right? It's like we're all having to do that. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and I like it, but I do also at the same time feel like my ability, I think like I can see maybe six months out, you know, with some amount of clarity. And when I, you know, talk to people, on the podcast, I'm like, I like apologize for even asking them to envision 2030. <laughs> and, or and occasionally I have asked and they're like, 2030, what are you nuts? <laughs> you know, like that's, uh, that's beyond anyone's event horizon. So yeah, I mean, I guess there's different meanings of confidence. I would, you know, I'm with you in that I, I do feel like I have enough command of the current situation to, you know, at least help people start to get up to speed. But I, I'm very reluctant to make, you know, any predictions that kind of get beyond 2023 at this point. I would totally agree. Yeah. So what is going back to the, the kind of board level conversations or, you know, where you're interacting with companies as a strategic advisor, I'm kind of keeping in mind this, you know, large pharma company type example. I have a, a fair degree of uncertainty around how quickly things are going to happen over, you know, the course of like this, you know, I've, I've called it the great implementation of kind of, we have GPT-4, it's, you can see a pretty clear path of being everywhere. You know, I am confident that there is a, a wave of transformation coming based on that deployment, but the speed of the wave time, you know, and exact kind of timing dynamics, how it plays out, you know, a lot more uncertainty there. So what have you seen in terms of the ambition of these companies? You could talk about that in a couple of ways, like timelines, but also, you know, like a pharma company, I could see, you know, wisely, I would say, you know, starting with something small and internal and, you know, like expense receipts, you know, you could ref you can reform all these little things that are kind of annoying today. But then you could also be like, um, you could imagine a world where it's instead of talk to your doctor about our drug, it's like, talk to our language model on our website as kind of the first thing you do before, you know, we then encourage you to go talk to a doctor. So like how ambitious are these companies thinking right now? And, and when do you think we see like the small and then the bigger changes? The first thing that I see is most people, in fact, like I would almost say all with an asterisk, uh, didn't have AI in their 2023 roadmap or budget. 
And so most of the conversations that I was helping companies have either directly or um, kind of supporting through content was how to think about like having that conversation and what investments might look like. Um, I recommend to a lot of companies that they do, they kind of take a page out of Silicon Valley's book and think about doing an internal hackathon with their team. Like, I think we're starting to see some of those start to play out over the next like couple months where companies are at least just giving their team the space to experiment and see where value could come from within anything, especially internal operations. Uh, you know, when you ask about like the, the really big broad strokes of like, wow, we don't recognize like what it means to be an e-commerce company or what it means to be a pharma company or what it means to do X, Y, and Z. Like, I do think those things are much further out and like much fuzzier, but um, I guess this is my bias. Like I, I sit in the day to day of like your team does so much manual work that they know is manual work. They don't love doing. They're sitting there on the slog and like they want to use these tools. How do you enable them to use some of these tools and kind of this like productivity unlock? And I think that's happening like, you know, now and exceedingly so in the next like three to six months. How do you see that shaping up? Because this is something I also have, you know, again, in terms of my limited confidence. If you'd asked me a couple months ago, I was very like, we got to curate the best tools. And in particular, I'm advising a, a friend's company, uh, which you know about, which is called Athena, which is in the executive assistant space. And as of January, I was like, we need to test a ton of tools. We need to curate the best tools. And then we'll have like this Swiss army knife of like proven things. It's going to be awesome. And, you know, we'll train all the EAs on how to use them. And that'll be like ultimately kind of a part of how we can position the company. And, I don't think that's wrong, but I do think the number of tools that I expected to be in that set has dropped precipitously uh, to where I'm now like, it might be like three, you know, or or even maybe just kind of one core one plus like other things that are naturally built into, you know, spreadsheets and whatnot where, you know, you, just the product itself changes. So what's your kind of expectation for that productivity suite over... So, you know, whatever, three to six months, like as that kind of matures, what do you think people are going to be using most? So I guess I also think about this question in two ways, which is when I tell people, hey, maybe think about giving your team space to do like an internal hackathon type uh, experience. Most of that is for building up what I think of as like AI literacy. Because again, I go back to like most companies did not have AI in their vocabulary before ChatGPT. And so I think we're just still in this space of, um, you know, people have like tried ChatGPT, but they're not using it on a regular basis because they can't really find like ways that it's useful. Also, they're probably still on the free version a lot of the time, which is a huge difference in value. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's open, like people don't really understand data privacy and the ownership of what happens to the prompts and the outputs that goes into that. So like, I think there's just a lot of adoption that needs to happen just from a like learning perspective. Um, and then from a tool side, I'm actually very much in the same boat as you. Like I encourage a lot of companies and teams to be uh, a little patient with the tools that they um, test out. Uh, my hot take, as I say, an annual plan is one of the worst things that you can uh, like commit to in this market because it's just changing so fast and you never know. Like one month, the uh, AI sales assistant tool could be the thing that you think is going to really like enable your team. And the next month, it could be something totally different. Right. Um, but I think that like some of the best success stories I've seen are when uh, companies and people building have like really close relationships and they're kind of like iterating through that together. So I, I think we're still so early on the the tools themselves in a lot of regards as well. But here's a hot take back. I think it's shaping up to be chat GPT as kind of the Google, you know, the canonical name brand, you know, iPhone equivalent of using an AI chatbot. And it seems like there will be certainly alternatives, but it seems like OpenAI has a pretty substantial lead. And for those that are really taking advantage of this stuff, it seems like that is going to be 
the hub. That's kind of my most likely projection for like later this year is like plugins come online, they work well, and everybody's like, ChatGPT plus, like it's the thing. That's what we're using. I think that could happen. I still feel like it's a little early. I think there are some dynamics that haven't like played out totally yet, uh, just from as I've like talked to people. I mean, one thing um, that a lot of people overestimate, I think, is like how many people are using ChatGPT on a regular basis. A lot of people have tried it. A lot of people haven't had success with it yet um, because maybe their prompt wasn't very good, right? Or they didn't figure out the right workflow. So I think we're still really early, but that could happen for sure. How much, so for, for me, I think the core thing is just the leap from 3.5 to four is so big. I wonder if you would, you know, agree with this general assessment, but in my experience, like so many things have gone from at 3.5, you know, still this kind of like art of eliciting decent performance, you know, really got to tinker and drill in on the the instructions and often, you know, a couple of examples and you're, you know, you got, I I had typically had the thing still pretty hard to get good results from, you know, anything up to 3.5. Yeah. I find with four, it's honestly pretty easy most of the time. And, you know, I have it like, so this company Athena is like a thousand plus people. I have a standing open invitation. Anyone can just send me whatever they want help with. And I usually find that like within a half an hour, I can kind of take their inputs and get to like a decent working output. Uh, how would you characterize that leap and kind of, you know, uh, to me, that's like the thing. If you went to ChatGPT and you used 3.5 and you like didn't get great results, like I would bet four out of five of those people would get good results if they had just used GPT-4. I mean, I'm curious when you have this open standing invitation, like how much of that do you feel like is because you're a good prompt engineer now? Not that much, honestly, anymore. Some, um, definitely I use like a number of kind of pretty standard techniques. Like we do, my go-to obviously is like some clear instructions that I usually don't find I have to like overly tinker with or refine those. Usually use like a role, you know, you are a copywriting expert or you are a, you know, a seasoned recruiting you know, executive or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually don't even have to use examples. I do use like a little bit of kind of know-how when it comes to kind of segmenting the prompt with a little markup to make it, you know, extra clear to the model, like which, you know, this is this and that is that. And that's been a huge advance from 3.5 to 4. Like that stuff just works now. Like it can, it can understand that document A and document B are like distinct things at a conceptual level and like synthesize in a way where it used to just kind of confuse even with you know, decent markup a lot of the time. So honestly, I don't know. I think like maybe I underestimate how hard it is to catch up, but I feel like I can communicate this stuff in like not a long time. And and usually do. Like usually when I get done with a, you know, half hour, hour call, like people are, they have a working thing and they, you know, feel like they can, you know, continue to elaborate it from there if they want to. That's where I feel like we're just still so early because like the techniques that you're describing, I think, we're still at a very, very small percentage of like the workforce um, or companies that even know about those. And uh, not for a lack of like interest, but just it's, you know, we're in, I think there's a bubble in the fact that like we're in AI all the time. We're thinking about it all the time, right? Uh, When I talk to businesses that are definitely paying attention to AI, but like they run an e-commerce business, like their day-to-day is not saying they're thinking about like, oh, does GPT-4 like recognize Markdown better now? Um, And I think we're going to get there, but yeah, it just, it still feels extremely, extremely early in uh, kind of the widespread adoption. And while I agree for like my use cases, I feel like 3.5 and 4, I even find myself like thinking like, how hard is this task? Okay, I should use 4 for it. Uh, versus uh, 3.5. Um, I think those are also still uh, like very new behaviors because um, all the stuff is still only like a couple months old. So yeah, like that's just, I mean, maybe that's just where I, I sit and like who I talk to on a day-to-day basis. Um, uh, but seeing like we're still so early in a lot of stuff. And I feel like then that's where like I get excited because while we feel like 
on a week-to-week -week basis, we have these huge step changes with things like auto GPT. A lot of companies are still just wondering what AI can do. And so it's not like auto, from 3.5 to 4, 4 to auto GPT feels like these step changes. Instead, it's more just like AI in general feels like this huge step change. And we're all just figuring out what what are the capabilities? What can it be used for? Does that make sense? Yeah, as you're describing that, it kind of is analogous to the grokking process that you know that, that underlies AI improvement, right? There, we see these kind of step changes at different scales, where there's like the three point five to four is like a very significant one. There's all these like little micro ones in between, and then for the public, you're kind of saying like it's basically zero to one. Like we didn't have this before, and now we have it, and that's kind of the the step change that people are having to contend with. Yeah. And I mean, like, uh, just another example, like even in early January, when I was talking to companies, they were describing things like agents, right? Like, oh, can I build it like a chat GPT for my company that goes and finds leads on LinkedIn and then figures out how to personalize those leads and then we'll send emails and then we'll like follow up to those emails. And I just give it like the goal of like close this lead. And I was like, okay, like, that's not quite how it works yet, but like, let me show you how to like break stuff down maybe into prompts and you can start playing. Okay, well now we have agents, right? But like to that person who was thinking about what AI could do for them, the problem it could solve for their business, they've more seen the step change of AI as opposed to the step change of where we're in the weeds of the actual capabilities, you know, and the, um, the technical feasibility of each of those, which, yeah, I mean, I, I find fascinating, like sitting between the two worlds, they're uh, sometimes um, uh, very different, and I find that really fun. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a fascinating perspective that you have and kind of uh, nexus point that you sit at. I didn't realize how much um, kind of higher-level corporate consulting you've been doing, but I think that is a fascinating space right now. Do you run into like, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? You're, as I understand you, an individual, and I know you have the business as well, but like, you show up for me, you know, with your face and like your personality on TikTok and and Twitter as well. Uh, but I do love the TikTok feed. In fact, you're one of maybe 10 or so TikTok AI creators of various sorts that we have curated a list for the EAs at Athena because we're just like, you know, you guys are collectively and even individually, but certainly collectively like creating much more content and keeping folks much more up to date than we possibly can internally. So, you know, we just <laughs> say like, follow these accounts. And, you know, next time you're on TikTok, we kind of, you know, uh, siphon off a little bit of your uh, entertainment budget for some AI education. I think that's honestly a strategy I'd recommend to a lot of companies as well. It's just kind of sharing like good sources. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, literally hundreds of short videos of digestible AI content on my TikTok, not even to mention like, yeah, there are a lot of really talented creators on there. So uh, it is a huge resource. Do you run into like Bane? <laughs> like who are you, do you get toward, I mean, public companies, board meetings sounds like you'd be to some degree overlapping with like a much different kind of consultant. And I wonder what you've seen uh, or heard about how they are approaching the market. So I guess taking a step back, um, I was a research data scientist at Meta. So like I worked on like some stuff with embeddings there, like ranking infra, um, a lot of stuff that now I'm like, wow, those were like fun projects for like having kind of a, a lens and a, a take on like what's going on. And then between then and now, um, I built a like e-commerce, like venture backed startup. And so I had the whole experience of like, okay, when you're trying to get something off the ground, like how much, you know, a labor of love and a ton of operations that frankly, like AI can really help with, um, uh, like that is. And so, um, I've really found my sweet spot and who I love talking to and helping are those like, uh, you know, startups, um, mid-sized companies, who are the ones who didn't have AI in their vocabulary very strongly last year, and now are thinking through like, what do I, I do next? Um, I, I think like there's excellent coverage at the the very top uh, of the market, you know, the Fortune 500s, the Fortune 100s. But there's going to be a, you know a lot of a lot of big projects, a lot of changes uh, that I I do hear and have uh, kind of exposure to, but. 
um, you know, I, I think back and I mean, even just like the companies that um, we worked with and helped, there is so much opportunity if you're a non-AI, let's say marketplace series A company to look at the bottlenecks in your marketplace and be able to start thinking about some of these problems in a new way. Um, and so, yeah, that's like the, the space that I've had a lot of fun working with people. You know, what are the common misconceptions that people have? And, you know, do you find that people, as they're new to this, like are generally optimistic or pessimistic? But I was kind of thinking of more of like a Main Street audience there. And it, um, you know, gathering that it's more of a still like a Silicon Valley audience, but it's like a non AI Silicon Valley type audience that you're mostly supporting. One of the interesting misconceptions is when I say to those like, you know, metrics earlier of like who's actually watching. Uh, at least my TikTok, like I think there are other AI TikTok creators who are more talking to um, the mass professional audience or even the mass consumer audience. Uh, you know, those people are ex exposed to different things. Um, I sit here and I talk about data privacy because I get asked that question like 20 times a week, right? Um, and people have like real questions that they're trying to navigate. Um, and so that's a lot of the stuff that I spend my time on. So kind of a, a different type of like influencer, I guess, in the space. Tell me a little bit about how you use AI in your business. Like what are you finding to be impactful, you know, and how do you anticipate that continuing to evolve? Yeah. So one of the things I tell people that, um, I think makes them feel a little bit better is like, I've tried a ton of stuff and a lot of stuff doesn't work. Like it's not just you, um, which I think some people like kind of think that they're the problem. It's like, no, 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 we're just really early on the tech. We use AI in a bunch of like micro uh, ways. So like things that you, you think like, oh, it'd be so nice for this to be automated, but like this was a little bit too complex to automate in the past, like throw GPT in there. It's a great simple like classifier. It's a great simple uh, kind of like connecting between like messy processes. Um, and so we have a lot of a lot of places we're using it there. So one is like when, so the way our business works is we um, have a free newsletter and then people can subscribe to like premium content. They get a community. Um, that's kind of our more like scaled offering for this kind of like consulting or business advice. And so a really big part of that is making sure that we know what are people struggling with and like what types of businesses, uh, business problems they have. And so we have a form um, that pulls all that information in, but then like, we're basically, we have a set of scripts that we run that do kind of like better natural language understanding of the common themes to inform what type of like content we're creating, or like, let's say we're creating a certain type of content on a topic. What are some of the most common like questions? All that stuff would have taken me like so long in the past to do with, uh, old school NLP. Uh, now super, super easy with a simple script. And then like, we'll also use it to like kind of personalize some of the outreach and like, Hey, uh, you mentioned this business problem in the past, like here's some content we just made. Um, so it's a lot of just like, yeah, feeling like you spent a hundred hours on something. Uh, and it was actually like 15 minutes. Right. Yeah. That's huge. I, I sometimes find myself talking about two modes of using AI, one being the kind of co-pilot paradigm where, you are, you know, prosecuting a task and you have this sort of, you know, sidecar, you know, helper that can autocomplete for you or maybe answer a question or what have you. Right. But you're kind of like owning where are we going right now? And then the other one, which you're speaking to there, where there's even more unlock. And I suspect kind of like a tipping point coming where <laughs> kind of everybody goes to this mode or like else. Um, is what I call delegation mode. And that is where you're like, I am now going to make this discreet enough that I can actually have the AI do the task. And then I will come and look at outputs, but I'm, I'm not going to sit there with it in real time doing it, right? And it's not going to be kind of assisting me. It's instead actually going to be performing the task. And, you know, again, hopefully, hopefully the, we, people are still reviewing the outputs. Uh, I think that's, <laughs> that remains important uh, for now, at least. But... How do you think about it? Is that, does that uh, dichotomy resonate with you or do you have a different way of framing it for people? No, I mean, I think that that's, um, I think it's a great way to think about it. You mentioned the intern analogy earlier, which 
I also really like. Um, someone suggested at one point that it was maybe a little bit more PC to use the alien analogy, which is like, if you have a thousand aliens coming to help you do stuff, um, what would you do? We use AI in both types of ways in our business. Like just another one on the co-pilot is um, like repurposing content, right? Is, uh, I mentioned this earlier, a huge part of creating content that like goes further. And if you have any type of like marketing background or have done that stuff before, like you know that you can just like copy paste the content between platforms, but frankly, your mindset is different when you're scrolling through TikTok versus when you're scrolling through a LinkedIn feed. And so content is going to perform better if you have a slightly different approach or different framing, um, different call to action, et cetera. And if you can get to a place with a prompt that really like nails that for you or gets close and it's like, oh my gosh, like I used to take so much time or I used to not even repurpose with, with kind of that intelligence at all. And like now it's, it's so easy. Like there are just a lot of those like smaller things that I, I think um, we use. And then a lot of businesses, like I encourage them to find those for them themselves. You do that in kind of co-pilot mode just via chat, chat GPT? Yes. Um, we also just like write scripts because it's easier. Uh, so I just have like a Python notebook that basically just sends that to chat GPT. Yeah. But I'll do it all, uh, uh, all just directly to the model. Yeah. So what's the, what's the rationale for that? Like I, I'm personally interested in this because I honestly have not mastered it myself. I find myself much more uh, inclined toward delegation mode versus co-pilot mode, interestingly, except in coding where I, f I feel like the, in that context, the autocomplete of like of the original GitHub co-pilot is amazing. And I, I definitely benefit from that. But so, yeah, tell me a little bit more about like, how are you doing this kind of repurposing? You start with what, and then you have these scripts and then like, are you reviewing? Or are you like trusted enough to like translate tweets to LinkedIn posts and go? I really want to understand the details of that. Yeah. So like one of the most common ones is like, I'll take a TikTok transcript. So like something I've already posted on TikTok. Um, and then I have a, a script, which I've, or like really it's a prompt that I've uh, honed in over time that will take that and like create a LinkedIn post draft, um, for example. And uh, to your question, no, I don't just set it on uh, autopilot of like, yeah, go forth and, and say kind of like uh, whatever's going to come out of chat GPT for me. And I really encourage like people don't do that. Um, but I found it can get pretty close. And especially if you, I mean, this is where the co-pilot and delegation model breaks a little bit, but it's like, if you look at your prompt of like, how would I coach someone else to repurpose this content? in the way that I think is gonna perform best on this channel, um, then you can kind of start to get to some of these prompts that work pretty well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that being said, like I would say we're still at maybe anywhere between two to 5% of the like capability that we could be getting out of the technology that's just like literally readily available today, even though we're like full-time trying things, experimenting, um, as I said, we tried lots of it doesn't work, which uh, I think is also great. Yeah, I mean, to me, I just look at like we're just so early in the adoption and like figuring out how uh, this technology is like really going to help us and um, yeah, and how businesses work. Two to five percent. That's not a lot. Uh, there's a long way to go. I mean, we don't have any agents going out and, uh, you know, automatically pulling your LinkedIn and, and emailing Nathan saying, you know, uh, hey, your, your stuff on Twitter is pretty cool. And let me tell you, you know, like, it, like we don't have that stuff uh, implemented, nor do I think that's like the place to start for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we're on the very, very early side, like as a society of like how much AI is going to change how we operate. Do you use, as you're trying to like get it to write like you in different formats, how much of that is pure like descriptive prompt versus few shot based on like, you know, prior conversions that you've done? So we've tried both. Um, what we have working right now is a combination. Like I'll pull in similar uh, LinkedIn posts for the certain type of content. So kind of like a, I mean, it's not uh, fully automated yet, but like these are the things we think through, which is like, hey, like if you could use embeddings to pull in 
a similar type of content, what would that look like? Right. Um, and then how could you use that to do few shot learning to get the post to feel more like what you want? All of it comes down to like, do you like the end output or not? And did it save you time? And like, if it didn't, then like try something new. Right. There seems like there's this, you know, maturing of all these tools that's going to take us from the sort of two to 5% to, you know, some significantly higher percentage, even if we don't, you know, get toward a hundred percent of potential. I wonder if you have a vision for like what the computing experience looks like as that matures. Like, you know, my venture was kind of, we all said using ChatGPT plus with plugins, but how, how would you begin to, it seems like it's not that far away. People are going to build, they're, they're building this stuff now. You know, we don't like all the, all the concepts seem to be there, the embeddings, the ability to like index your Gmail history, whatever, like conceptually, it's easy to say that. In practice, you know, I've, I would not fork over my Gmail history to baby AGI just yet. So a lot of it seems like it's down to kind of engineering, but also like coalescing around certain paradigms or UIs that are just so nascent. Do you have a sense for like what it's going to be like to sit at a computer and do stuff in, you know, whatever, six, nine, 12 months? I mean, I feel like it could be pretty different than what we do today. I mean... A lot of me like hopes that it's different. Uh, like I have this other hot take, which is like, I think as a society, we all like work way too much and do t way too much of the same stuff every day. Um, I mean, that's not like necessarily a hot take, but I'm like, I think it's like really not a bad thing if we are all working maybe like an actual 40 hours a week instead of what we like pretend is 40 hours. Um, but in terms of like what that looks like, I mean, I don't know. like. I think I understand it like we're still so early and and trying to predict what things are going to be and is maybe like not the right mindset the or not, not, not to like uh, challenge like your way of thinking too much but um, it's more like how do you just like pay attention to like what is changing and what is happening um, so that you can see like how certain trends are progressing for example one I'm paying attention to a lot right now is like. Um, all the experiments of GPT-4 being able to code an entire application from someone's like voice command, like that is huge, right? Um, and could have a profound impact on like us having highly personalized software or uh, a business who has been who has sticky notes next to their like laptop trying to say, okay, like my software doesn't do X, Y, and Z, but like if we do this, 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 this like hacky thing, it can do this. Okay, well. If the cost of creating like more personalized software or software in general is like dropping a lot, okay, maybe that stuff starts to like, you know, not be problems anymore. Um, yeah, maybe like long way of saying like, I, I wouldn't plan to flag in the ground and say like, we're all gonna have ChatGPT plugin marketplace like on our phone and it's gonna be the only mega app, right? But I do think things are gonna change a lot. And it seems like it's very clear that the agent paradigm will get you to the point where these sort of user interface tasks that are kind of tedious and time consuming can largely be delegated. Do you want to like come back and watch like sped up, you know, uh, videos of what it did and like find yourself like on the checkout page, like ready to, you know, hit confirm or whatever, almost like a rewind, except, you know, the AI is doing the thing and you're like rewinding the AI's activity instead of your own. Yeah, I mean, and then there's like the question of like, if everybody can post on Twitter, and everybody has an AI that just like takes their raw thoughts and puts them into like high performing tweets, and everybody is using these agents, okay, is anybody actually on Twitter anymore? Right? Um, or like, what's the value of being on, like being on these platforms, if you have then a summarizing agent that pulls the most interesting tweets of the day? Like, I think you can get a little bit too, and they're, they're fun thought experiments, like you can get walk through step by step by step and saying, well, then this will happen, then this will happen, then this might happen. But yeah, that's then where it becomes really like, I think, messy and hard to predict like this is going to be how this all plays out. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, radical uncertainty is my kind of starting point for any... Uh, that would have been a good name of the of a podcast <laughs> right now. Yeah. The other one that uh, we had considered was AI Summer, which um, I think would have been a good one as well. Yeah. The Bing launch. I don't know if you uh, have a good story to tell there, but that must have been quite a bizarre experience in 
multiple ways. Uh, I feel really positive about companies that are like launching, uh, you know, what they're building in this market. I think, frankly, if you zoom out to some degree of a time horizon, um, the learnings you get from launching early, I think do like, I fall on the side of like, it, it does outweigh, uh, the potential risk of just like waiting way too long to like start putting this stuff out into the market. But on the launch itself, I mean, it was really, so I do have a kind of a funny story on this, which is that like, I was not an influencer before or a creator before, like that's like not my background. And so I was very new to a lot of this stuff. Um, but I literally got a cold email from Microsoft uh, just saying, like, we want to fly you out for this thing, but we can't tell you what it is. And uh, at the time, like, you can't tell anybody that you even got this email. <laughs> um, and I was like, and that was kind of one of my first experiences of getting something like that. I mean, things have happened since uh, that have been, I realize that's more like the MO when you're an influencer. But like, at the time I was like, well, this is either going to be like the the story, you know, it ended pretty badly, right? Like it's uh, flown out. You don't know where you're going. Uh, it says Microsoft.com in the email address, but like, I don't know how that could be spoofed. Um, but I was like, yeah, like, I it, I'll just go for it, right? It's kind of like my personality. Um, and so then I said like, yeah, sure, I'll come. And uh, yeah, it ended up being really fun because it was... Um, you know, I got to meet other, it was like a lot of the like AI reporters were there. Um, so I got to like make some friends. I generally agree. And I think there has been a pretty strong demonstration of the wisdom of making some contact with the broader public, right? Like looking back on the timeline of GPT-4, and I didn't know this at the time, but I was in this like weird position where I was participating in the Red Team program and, you know, had access to the model and was like, exploring that, you know, full-time obsessively, like writing all these reports for them, et cetera, et cetera. They did not give us though any other information. So I was like totally in the dark as to like what their plans were. And the version we were working with was the raw form that, you know, did not have any of the safety mitigations and was like pretty crazy. So I was genuinely nervous coming out of that period. Like what exactly are they going to do next? And, you know, are we entering into like a period of total insanity? And then what they actually did shortly thereafter was launch ChatGPT with 3.5 instead of four and, you know, kind of allowed all those jailbreaks to happen. And, you know, I, nobody's ever like confirmed this to me, but it seems quite clear that that was a strategic plan to like get the jailbreaks out, you know, largely on 3.5 and then, you know, be able to roll that whole data set into extended training. So I, I do broadly agree that like, it does not, you know, as Sam Altman kind of says, like, it does not make sense to go develop a godlike AI, maybe not at all, but if you're going to probably still doesn't make sense to like develop it all in secret and then just, you know, drop it on the world all in one, you know, zero to one moment. So I do agree with your perspective that like it, it does, it is important to launch stuff, not only for business, but even just for like society. At the same time, that felt rushed. And like, to me, like kind of extremely so I've got, a, I'm putting a piece together actually where I'm like documenting this, like going back in time and like, you know, kind of Twitter archaeologying, like who knew what, when, you know, and how did this happen? But it seems like they definitely were rushing it and like kind of at an executive level, I feel like they should do better. You know, you should not release your bot in a stage where it's like actively hostile to users. And, you know, some of those transcripts were like just a simple disagreement, you know, about the date, right? We were not, this was not like a jailbreak type phenomenon. I feel like that's, you know, when people try to break the model, I put that in a very different class from like when the model breaks on someone who's just acting earnestly and trying to interact with it. So it felt like super rushed to me. Did you, did you feel like they had things like buttoned up at the time or did you see a sort of like, because I the big worry obviously is the race condition, right? For the for the people that worry about AI safety long term, and I'm definitely one of them, as enthusiastic as I am. You know, the wor the thing that people worry about most is like if we get into a race condition, everybody's just cutting corners and whatever, like that's really bad. It to me, it feels like that's kind of what happened there. 
Um, but I wonder what your perspective is, if that like resonates or feels off, you know, given that you flew out and, and sat uh, in person with them when they did it. Yeah, I, I just go back to like, I am definitely a proponent of like, you need, you need feedback to learn stuff. Um, I also, I feel like working record, but I like, I feel like we're so early and a lot of this like technology, what it even means to like red team these products, I would wager we know way more now than we knew, uh, three, four months ago on some of these teams. Yeah, I completely agree. Like you should not have a bot that, uh, is aggressive to users or, um, OpenAI has a moderation endpoint. Like that should be a given if, especially if you're launching something high profile. And like, I know there were some launches recently that didn't use that endpoint. Um, like that stuff is really important. That being said, I think that there's a little bit of like, you learn from your failures too. And I think that sometimes some of these, like, I mean, you zoom out, they're not that big of issues and we learned a heck of a lot and like, you know, people are going to be uh, way more cautious um, in a lot of these, avoiding a lot of these like, problems in the future. Uh, yeah, largely, I, th I agree. I would like to see them publicly own it a little bit more and, and like kind of publicly learn a, a lesson that may be, you know, wishful thinking on my part. But it is striking to me that we're entering this era where it's like these technologies are not super easy to control. You know, one of my biggest just two by <laughs> one of my investors used to say two by four to the head obvious and definitely a two by four to the head obvious point that I've, you know, deeply understood through the red teaming and everything else is just the good behavior of this class of large language model definitely does not come, you know, by default. It is not like easy to create. Uh, they have like a hell of a time, you know, with false positives and false negatives on refusal. And, you know, it's just very far from being a solved problem. And so, yeah, it's not, cra it's not you know, somebody was going to do something like Sydney at some point and, and make that mistake. It doesn't sit great with me that it was like the biggest, you know, one of the very biggest companies in the world who I would think should have probably known a little bit better. And it definitely still doesn't sit that well with me that like they haven't kind of come back around and been like, yeah, we kind of fucked up. You know, we, we rushed this thing out and like, what's the standard going forward? You know, sh should I expect this type of behavior from Word uh, in the near future? Or like, is Excel going to be like, you know, intruding into my marriage? I mean, I, I just think that there's somebody should probably like at least articulate a standard that they, you know, plan to uphold for themselves. I should also say too, like, uh, you know, I, I, I went to that event. I've worked with Google on some stuff. I've worked with Adobe. Like I, I, I'm working like across the space, which I think is another like uh, fun perspective I get to have, right? Which is just being able to see a lot of the stuff, um, you know, opening eye uh, that's going on. Like, I love this because I'm like the, the challenge that I would throw back to you is like, okay, yeah, but like imagine if these types of things were hap like were happening with much more powerful models, does having bad uh, or like not great experiences today like help us decrease like decrease the risk of that happening with other models in the, in the future? I think it. I think it does. I think we're actually. I'm very pleased with how things have gone relative to how you know I feared that they might, and you know it seems like there is kind of a. I mean, just today, right? Um, last night at MIT, Sam Altman kind of said, and now there's been this like wave of Twitter messaging from OpenAI employees that's like, we're not training GPT-5. I think that's a very key part of the kind of plan that you're you know, describing. Like, we do need some time to actually work these things out. So yeah, I agree. I, I, I view it very differently, I think, in a world where GPT-5 is currently training versus what they're saying now, which is that it's not. I think that makes a huge difference to how you kind of understand the like, the early release decision making. I'm grateful <laughs> that there is like some, you know, restraint uh, at the top of this trend because, you know, it is so powerful that, uh, you know, I do kind of, it's not hard for me to imagine that it could really get entirely out of control. Think about um, the mass adoption of this technology in different companies, right? If a mid sized company has some, bad prompt injection uh, exploits happen, that doesn't educate the market. 
potentially as well as a bigger company uh, having things. Like I don't buy uh, that Snapchat's My AI is the only uh, chat GPT bot that has talked about stuff that told the bot not to talk about, right? Um, but it is the one that's like highest profile. And so I think that does a good job of also like educating the market of like, hey, anybody who's building anything that looks like this now knows of that story and is uh, protecting against it. What Are you hearing things from people about like the alpaca, you know, llama moment? Yeah. Um, and what do you advise people when they ask you like, hey, this llama thing's out there and I heard it's just as good as uh, ChatGPT. Like, what's your response to that kind of thinking? I mean, I think one thing is uh, I always remind people I'm not a lawyer and you need to talk to a lawyer about like the commercial use or just general like use of these different models in your business, not just like limited to llama and alpaca. Like I tell them that for everything. But I mean, I think if you like look at the writing on the wall, we're going to have powerful open source models as well in this uh, large language model space. And so, yeah, like there's I think there's just an element of people getting comfortable with the technology. And yeah, I guess like I'm more afraid of mistakes made later than us learning now um, is just my like general take. Yeah. But I would not advise somebody to go implement something that's not commercially licensed into their core product. <laughs> you know, let's imagine that they were like, okay, cool, it's released. Uh, but it's still just this sort of pre-trained, totally unrefined, um, you know, and therefore more unwieldy, more, you know, whatever uh, alien-like thing. I don't have a mature framework for thinking about this yet, but it, it does seem like the one of the things we talked about, you know, much earlier in the conversation around internal like task automation versus a sort of element of your service is probably a really critical distinction there because if you did have a llama and you know then it was commercially licensed and all that and you then like applied your you know 10,000 example instruction fine tuning and then you are like in control of how it's being used in the context of some task i would expect you'd probably get you know could get pretty good results and might be happy that you did it Whereas if you try to like take a shortcut to cheap chat GPT and then like put a chat bot on your website um, that's based on Llama, I would expect that you would be quickly embarrassed. Definitely. I mean, yeah, like the risk uh, profile of launching something poorly thought out externally is like infinitely higher uh, than like experimenting internally. Um, I mean, a lot of teams who go back to like, I talked to a lot of teams who did not have AI in their 2023 roadmap. When they asked me like, where do I start? I really try to encourage them to think about the internal use cases because like the risk is just so much lower. Um, if you don't have that experience already, like you're going to get your feet wet, uh, and you're going to learn really quickly that, uh, like how these models work and what their limitations are. Right. Um, I think a good example would be like if somebody had launched a uh, chat bot on their website that goes in like um, can summarize web pages and it was 3.5, um, they might think that it actually does that, but then, and they might offer that service to their customers. But if they instead had started with like, okay, well, let's use this internally first, where we're using GPT 3.5 to summarize web pages, they would, they would eventually figure out or learn or just uh, like have the experience to say, oh, this actually isn't doing that, right? Um, and that's just a very, I don't think most people are confused on that point, but like, um, it's just like one example of like, when you're using something internally, uh, you do have more of a tight feedback loop of like, how this is actually working. Yeah, it's critical. Education, it all starts with education, uh, which is, I think, uh, why you're in such an interesting spot right now, because you've been uh, doing a great job at educating so many people. Couple quick closing questions for you. Just cool tools that you would recommend to the audience that are not like the obvious ChatGPT. The number one thing I recommend to people is start using ChatGPT with an automation tool like Zapier or Make. A, it's fun. And B, I think that tends to be the big unlock for a lot of people and actually starting to use stuff. I'm gonna give a random shout out, which is supermeme.ai. 
because we are using AI for like so many things that are like so serious. So like business productivity oriented. And honestly, sometimes it's just really fun to use AI to make much better memes. And like, I've never been a person who's good at making memes before. And now I feel like I can make ones that make me laugh at least. So I would uh, definitely go check that out. Yeah, that's cool. We made the art for this show with Playground AI. And I mean, that's would have been completely impossible for me to do that previously. So I do love those kind of things that just unlock a, a totally new, uh, just like, per, you know, capability for me as an individual. Um, okay, second one. You kind of alluded to this earlier as well, but hypothetical scenario, a million people have a Neuralink implant. Whenever that, however long that takes, we're at a million uh, implants. If you get one, you can control your device straight from your thoughts. So you could like transmit, you know, thoughts to text or thoughts to like UI control and be hands-free uh, using a computer. Would that be enough to have you interested in potentially getting one? Oh, I like put me on the short list for the early experiments. <laughs> no, uh, I, my husband is a... Um, uh, as a doctor. So, uh, he would read all, I trust him to read all of the stuff that I would need to think through to make that decision. But then assuming it's a, it's a go, put me on the list. <laughs> You're in good company with that answer. That's a pretty polarizing question we found more so the, than even the tools, uh, where people are more often just like, I don't know. I pretty much just use chat GPT. If I can, what's your answer? I'm just curious. Oh, I would definitely be open to it. I mean, I think this is, it's a question that's, I think it's revealing about how people think. And I like asking it for that reason. I also think, of course, it's like a way too specific hypothetical. And, you know, the actual answer might be like, you know, by the time that is mature, I already can kind of do that with my like Apple glasses or whatever, but just by like twitching my eyes. And that's like comfortable enough that, you know, nobody needs to drill in the skull. Um, so... I'm not that confident that, you know, I'll end up wanting to do that when it becomes available, but I would be definitely open to it in a, you know, in a narrow hypothetical where it's like the world is like it is today, but you could have that. I have three kids and uh, they have my hands full pretty often. So it's definitely, there's a lot of moments where I'm like, you know, taking them on a walk through the neighborhood or whatever. And I'm like, I wish I could just jot this thought down before it totally escapes me. So honestly, for that alone, I would be and it might, you know, could also be a wearable, perhaps in the future could be a little less radical. But even with the uh, the implant, I would be open to it. I'm like, I already had an advantage. I already wear glasses. So like I could just throw it in the glasses, right? If you listen to uh, Robert Scoble, that's coming, the first version that's coming this year. I don't know. There's, there's, there's a couple of these like stealthy device, you know, AI things that um, I really don't know much about, but could make a huge splash in the potentially like not too distant future. Um, okay, last one, just zooming out big picture um, as wide as you kind of can. What are your biggest hopes for and fears for society as this AI wave kind of <laughs> washes over everything? My biggest hope is that we get to a place where we're frankly working less. And I put an asterisk on that a little bit because I think What's more exciting to me is that we get to a world where work looks more like the type of work a lot of people do kind of on weekends or on vacations that's casual. You're thinking about things when you feel inspired to think about things and you're able to solve like the bigger problems at hand instead of kind of at least for me, like the work week is just so busy and full of so many things all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think it sounds like pretty great to feel like you're on vacation all the time, uh, but still able to like kind of cont contribute and drive what you care about forward. Um, biggest fear, I think about this a lot, which is um, a major like motivating factor for how I spend my time. Is I think that we want to have a future with diverse businesses, diverse perspectives, and if. Uh, the way that things play out, only 1% of people are actually adopting this technology. I think that's a worse future than us having broader adoption um, and continuing to have like competition. Uh, and so like what I'm more afraid of is, yeah, centralized adoption as opposed to democratized access. 
Cool. Well, you are doing your part to uh, try to avoid that future. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Rachel Woods, thank you for being part of the Cognitive Revolution. Thanks for having me. This is fun. OmniKey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use CogRev to get a 10% discount.